Hello everyone, and welcome to the third episode of Empty Notes, Trucks of Future Past. In this episode, we'll be talking about philosophical and fictional approaches to the future. Futurism, retrofuturism, utopianism, and something I'd like to call post-retrofuturism. In short, this is going to be a bit of a theory-focused episode. But we'll begin this episode by talking about a truck. A cyber truck, that is. In case you haven't heard, last year Elon Musk announced some strange vehicle called a cyber truck, which is supposed to be an electric competitor to many off road truck like camper vehicles. Its shape is perhaps its most notable feature. It is very polygonal, very blocky, very triangly. This is probably on purpose, because it reminds me most of the retrofuturist aesthetic known as cyberpunk. If you don't know what cyberpunk is, cyberpunk is a genre, an aesthetic and literary genre that originated in the 1980s and features a lot of things people found cool in the 80s and 90s. You know, leather trench coats, sunglasses, early computer graphics hacking, that sort of stuff. If you're thinking Max Headroom mixed with Robocop mixed with The Matrix, you'll know what cyberpunk is. In any case, since it's called the Cybertruck, I'm pretty sure that was the main inspiration for the aesthetic of this vehicle. I'd say that's rather ironic because one of the main features of cyberpunk is the existence of huge hyper-capitalist megacorporations which try to control every aspect of our lives. Honestly, any kind of anti-capitalist sci-fi, including possibly cyberpunk, would be pretty clear in depicting a person like Elon Musk as one of its bad guys. Do you think he knows this? Anyway, I thought this Cybertrunk story would serve as a good segue into a discussion of futurism, and Silicon Valley futurism more specifically. So, let's talk about it. What is futurism? Well, Futurism is the pursuit of a specific type of public intellectual. Usually they're part of the capitalist class or one of their lackeys. They have this idea of how the future will go or how they can make themselves look like they know how the future will go. And then some gullible billionaire or NGO will find themselves throwing money at that guy just to see what rolls out. You see this a lot with Silicon Valley in particular, of course, because Silicon Valley likes to pride itself as the cutting edge of what modern neoliberal capitalism is capable of. And so you get these venture capitalist entrepreneurs who come up with one idea or the other of where the future will go. And they throw money at that and sometimes it sticks. This is, of course, how people like Elon Musk got into their money. They made money through PayPal and then they used that money to throw it into these new ventures like SpaceX, the boring company, Tesla Motors. And, well, nine times out of ten that doesn't work out, but sometimes you get these basic success stories. And as long as you have these powerful people throwing out these success stories, then it looks like the system is working. So that's kind of where we're at in terms of futurism. Now, let's start talking about retrofuturism, because that is slightly different and, to me, slightly more interesting. Retrofuturism is more of an aesthetic and literary movement instead of an actual science. I'm using very big quotes here which focuses on the future not as it will be, but on the future as it could have been. It basically takes the predictions of futurists' past and takes them more literally, and wonders, well, what if those visions of a hundred years ago were not as inaccurate as they later proved to be? It's sort of nostalgia mixed with science fiction. Perhaps the most visible example of this would be steampunk, just because it's so different from what we're used to. Steampunk's aesthetic is mostly based off the early science fiction works of writers like H.G. Wells or Jules Verne, although it's taken on a life of its own ever since then, and tries to marry a punkish DIY aesthetic with gears, steam engines, monocles, basically any sort of Victorian pastiche. It's not ever supposed to be historically accurate, it's not supposed to be scientifically accurate, that's for sure. It's just supposed to take this very heightened aesthetic of what the steam age was like and then basically turn every sort of modern technology into steam. So steam spaceships, steam airplanes, a lot of airships in general, 
you know, people in colonial outfits going around colonizing other planets, these sorts of imaginaries. Another branch of retrofuturism, which will become important later on, is something I would call rocket punk. Rocket punk mostly takes the aesthetic of 1950s and 1960s science fiction, so a lot of UFOs and semi-realistic rocket ships, and basically, again, accelerates that style, culture, and technology until it becomes much larger than life, until you have, like, people with laser guns going off to Jupiter or something like that. It usually depends on what flavor of rocket punk you have, because there's more of the 40s or 30s style, which is more unrealistic, more pulpy, more fantastical, and then there's the more 50s or 60s variety, which is slightly more realistic, but still has a lot of, you know, antiquated computer technology, sexist power relations, that sort of stuff. And this will become important later on. In any case, now that we know what futurism and retrofuturism are, it's time to start asking, well, what's wrong with them? What merits a whole podcast episode dedicated to them? Well, in the case of these Silicon Valley futurists, most of what they're doing is just either taking fanciful science fiction predictions like, oh, well, humanity is probably going to Mars someday, so I might as well invest in it. Or they're just extrapolating current circumstances like, well, wealth inequality is growing, a capitalism reigns supreme, so anything we can predict must stay within those parameters. And this is what I would consider their ultimate lack of vision. They're unwilling to look beyond their own social and economic circumstances towards a radically altered future. And because of that, their futures will just be shameful representations of the present. So, if these ideas have any merit, let's try applying them to a contemporary example of futurism. You know, the Cybertruck. So, what's wrong with the Cybertruck? Well, first of all, there's the fact that it looks and probably is a death trap. I mean, it's nice to create a car that looks like a polygon, but if it doesn't have any crumple zones, it's going to kill some people. Secondly, it has these windows which were supposed to be shatterproof or bulletproof or something. But just with two stone throws to two windows, well, that was two for two in terms of broken stuff. So, ooh, bad going there, Elon. But these are the material details. The main philosophical point I'm trying to make is that the Cybertruck is not a future. It doesn't do anything. All right, so let's say five years from now, a bunch of rich nerds have ordered Cybertrucks and are driving around. Well, I mean, they're not pumping gasoline, so I guess that's good. But the batteries are still made from lithium. So bad, bad, bad. But perhaps the most supreme sin of all is the fact that the Cybertruck doesn't challenge our society. It doesn't challenge our car-obsessed culture. Cars, personal automobiles have a few distinct uses and they've genuinely helped some people. But other than that, the idea that car ownership should be ubiquitous and that they should dominate our street view and just general transport infrastructure is completely and utterly wrong. If it was up to me, we'd eliminate car use to the greatest extent that it's possible, change urban spaces to be less car focused, enhance public transport infrastructure, probably make all that stuff free or as free as can be, and just live by what we need, not by what makes the most profit for automobile manufacturers and the individualized consumer culture that we live in in general. Does that make sense? Does that sound nice? Ugh, I certainly hope so, because I'm tired of living in Musk's future, which is pretty much the present, only worse. Now, maybe you're thinking that retrofuturism can be somehow better. I mean, if the problem with the neoliberal present is that we're lacking any vision, that maybe we can go back to the time in the past when they did have vision, you know, when great men build great machines and we sent a man on the moon and we did other amazing things. Well, again, you're talking about we and this is where the problems pop in because I would argue in certain ways retrofuturism is even worse than regular futurism. Why? Well, when you become too enamored with the past, even if it's the future that existed in the past, you tend to become a fascist real quick. 
This is because most of the pasts that people are referring to so romantically weren't actually better than the way things are now. Just take the example of steampunk. While it may be fun to emulate the aesthetics of the Victorian period, would you really want to copy their social mores? There's a reason the adjective Victorian has the meaning it does, you know. Most people lived very poor and oppressed lives in the social if not the economic sphere. And even when it comes to retrofuturisms that are more contemporary, you know, the rocket punk taking from NASA visions from the 1960s, you know that no woman ever landed on the moon, right? It was a pretty white male endeavor and anyone who didn't fit that pattern was generally marginalized within the program itself. That is why movies like Hidden Figures are so important, because they show us that the past was not the way that people presented the past. Or the future of the past, for that matter. See, this is the problem with creating retrofuturism. If you're just uncritically copying the way that people from decades before pictured the future, then you're also uncritically replicating all their prejudices. Ironically, the most anachronistic aspect of such an endeavor may not be the accelerated technology that seems impossible. No, it's the society that never existed in the way that people perfectly portrayed it, or at least shouldn't exist in the way that people so perfectly portrayed it. A good example of this would be the Fallout franchise of video games. In these games, the world of the 1950s is basically projected into the future, complete with its social ideals and technological marvels. So there's robots doing the cooking, but your housewife is also still in the kitchen, if that makes sense. The point is that the social ideals of these very repressive eras are not to be replicated uncritically. But instead, you see that this retrofuturist aesthetic is just completely unironically celebrated. It's marketed in every form and even the opening of the game has you existing in that pre-war world and just enjoying some sort of like fun 1950s domestic life which we all know had a lot of horrors underneath the surface but they never get into that. They just portray it was all idyllic before the bobs dropped. Though they know better. Or they should. All right. Now that I've critiqued both futurism and retrofuturism, also known as the cruel capitalism of the present or the potential crypto-fascism of the past respectively, let's talk about utopianism. As I understand it, utopianism is exactly this radical, transformative imagination that we are entirely missing in contemporary futurism. It is the imagination of far-flung alternate worlds where everything can be perfect and we can have a society that works for everyone. Of course, utopianism itself is not without controversy. Most of the anti-utopian sentiment comes from a position of fear and danger about what utopian ideals might do to people. Like, oh, if we're going to have a perfect society in the future, what does it matter how high the body count stacks up right now? But I don't think this is a fair representation of utopianism on the whole. After all, while a utopia describes the possibility of a better society by definition, it does not need to prescribe any path to achieving it. The problem with authoritarian utopians is not that they're utopians, but that they're authoritarians. It's also worth knowing that anti-utopianism can be pretty authoritarian itself precisely because it keeps us from imagining a better world. When you live in a world of structural violence, anti-utopianism is just one more way to keep you down. It's exactly why contemporary futurism suffers from such lack of vision. Their imagination is inherently tied to maintaining an oppressive status quo. I also think that people who say that utopianism is dangerous have a strange conception of utopianism. They think that people who practice utopian imaginations literally believe in the existence of that utopia in a coming future. Whereas to me, the tradition of utopianism has always already contained this element of the unreal, of the imaginary, of the mysterious. Utopia is not just a good place, a utopos, as the Greek etymology of it goes, but also a 
no place and u topos. So you see already in sort of the framing of the word itself, there's both an element of a good society and a non-existent and imaginary society. And that tradition goes on to this day. For example, the modern anarchist movement takes a lot of inspiration and imagination from this semi-utopian novel called The Dispossessed, which was written by science fiction fantasy author Ursula Le Guin. And this novel itself takes place on a faraway planet in a faraway future. Like, you know it's never going to be real, but it doesn't matter because it still inspires you. And that inspiration is what pushes you forward. And this to me is the core of utopian literature. It's not about creating a completely plausible future. It's not about creating the perfect practical path to full anarchism, communism, what have you. No, it's about getting your imagination going and starting to think about what you really would like society to be like. And in that sense, it's an outgrowth of the present just as much as futurism is. It's just daring to take on that present from a more radical more socially engaged perspective. So, that's futurism taken care of. Just do utopianism instead. But what about retrofuturism? It doesn't seem we can change that genre as easily, so should we just do away with its old bigotries? Well, here is where I want to suggest a reconfiguration of my own. Something I'd like to call post-retrofuturism. Post-retrofuturism is the idea that we take retrofuturism, as well as the critiques that I've launched against it just earlier, and try to synthesize them into a new genre that can be just as interesting when it comes to reinvigorating the future ideals of ages past, but still have that critical eye towards the social bigotries which were inherent to those imaginations. That's why I'm calling it post-retrofuturism. Now, I have two or so examples I mean to discuss in the context of this new genre. One of what you shouldn't do, and one of what might look closer to the post-retro future ideal. The first of these is a novel series called The Lords of Creation by S.M. Sterling. It came out around 10 years or so, and imagines the pulpy, pseudo-scientific perspective on Mars and Venus as being actually astronomically real. So, what if Mars was a planet of dying canals and lost civilizations, and what if Venus was a planet of teeming swamps and Neanderthals? Now, the author knows, of course, that this premise is inherently implausible, so, spoiler warning, he incorporates certain plot elements to make sure it becomes plausible. He supposes that ancient aliens may have terraformed these planets and seeded them with Earth life over millions of years, and that's why they end up exactly as these pulp writers imagined them. Admittedly, I find this to be a pretty clever conceit, and the writer carries it through to its logical conclusion. Once the Soviet Union and the United States start sending probes to these other planets and they realize what's going on out there, they start a space race that's like a hundred times as big as the historical one was, just because there's two living planets out there that need to be explored, at least before the other party gets its hands on whatever treasures they might hold. So that's, from an alternate history perspective, a pretty good plot and a pretty good premise. However, when it comes to the social aspect, which I've specifically been critiquing retrofuturism for, this novel series still leaves something to be desired. I haven't read too much of it yet, but the writing just strikes me as just as sexist or just as stereotypical as the period in which it is set would suggest, and that's just unpleasant, and again, kind of unironically, uncritically replicates those bigotries. So, I'm not sure about it. It's not the post-retrofuturism I'd like to have. So, let's turn to this other example, which, incidentally, is also a novel series. It's called the Lady Astronaut series, and the novels released so far mostly take place during the 1950s and 60s, the heydays of space age enthusiasm, and it plays into that era very well. From a technical perspective, it asks what would be required to really see the sort of space settlement expansion that was predicted in those days, and its answer is basically an existential threat to humanity's life. That's the sort of thing that would allow for the sort of budgets to be expended to really get us out there in sufficient volumes. 
which, just like in the Lords of Creation series, is a pretty interesting idea and a good motivating factor throughout the work, but it sounds mostly technical, like what about the social imagination? Well, here I was surprised. The author knows very well that their work takes place in a rather repressive era when it comes to gender and race issues, and doesn't shy away from depicting these injustices whenever they occur. It probably helps that the main protagonist is a Jewish woman who is eager to get out into the stars herself, but is obviously rejected because of the sexism of her time and tries to campaign against that. But even so, she is confronted with further injustices from perspectives she sometimes fails to consider. For example, by the time of the second book, spoiler warning, she is a full-fledged astronaut, but realizes that most people won't be able to join the evacuation off Earth if that is to occur in the future, along with those social bigotries that exist also keeping people from the program, generally people with non-male, non-white identities, and she realizes this is an impromptu eugenics program. The way they're selecting for people is already creating a biased perspective on what the future of humanity will look like. And this is terrible. And the book is honest about this. It's willing to confront these issues and, if possible, resolve them. And that's what sets it apart from most retrofuturist work. It's not the way in which it is technically interesting or the complicated way in which it justifies its main premise. No, it's the way in which it is capable of confronting the era it is set in the imagination that existed in that era, and thereby the futurism of that era. And that's, to me, what makes it post-retrofuturism. It maintains a social critical perspective, even in a setting that's become increasingly fantastical. So that's what I have to offer you, a genre which takes the ideas and aesthetics of retrofuturism, but is a little more self-conscious about it. I hope you like this little discussion of mine. If you're interested in more of my takes on the various genres of science fiction and fantasy, be sure to take a look at my personal blog, theinnermoon.com. There are some essays there where I explore similar lines of thought and try to come up with my own little genres, which might embody what I find most valuable in each tendency of our popular fiction. But this is it for now. This has been Moon, and I hope to see you soon.